Hey, I'm Caleb Howard, and this is Tales from Sacred Texts, a religious folklore and Christian theology podcast. Here, we discuss stories from the Bible, the Apocrypha, and the fine line between myth and history surrounding various belief systems. We take on the stories in a sarcastic and humor-driven way that doesn't take itself too seriously, but still shines a light on the principles and ideology behind the stories and their origin. As promised, this episode will be about the Rebellion of Korah, but after researching the topic a little bit more, I don't think I can start with the Rebellion. Instead, we'll begin with the story of a man named Caleb, and how his actions started the chain of events that led to the Rebellion. This week and next, we'll learn that if God tells you not to kill some people, you should probably not kill those people. Maybe. The people in this story tried it quite a few times, indicating that they really had a hard time learning that lesson. Hopefully, it'll be easier for y'all. This is a story from the Old Testament of the Protestant Bible and is set about a year after the Hebrews escape Egypt, something that we discussed in episode 7 and 8 of season 1. The Hebrews have slowly made their way toward the promised land of Israel, but now they are stopped at the border and they're wondering if they actually want to go in. All right. Let's get into the story. Caleb wasn't exactly sure why everyone wanted to kill him. They were saying things like, You want to have an opinion? Opinions are for how you like your mana toppings, not for anything that people can legitimately disagree on. Caleb wasn't exactly sure why everyone was making such a big deal of this. He was just trying to tell them that God was perfectly capable of fulfilling the promises he'd made to them a long time ago, and that this was a great place to live. It's a land that eats up its inhabitants, someone howled as they picked up rocks to throw at Caleb until he died. I love to go with the kitschy TV trope where they start with a dramatic scene and then show a tranquil scene with the label 24 hours earlier. But this isn't mediocre television, so more accurately, we'll have to go back about two months to get to the beginning of the whole ordeal. Caleb was a normal guy. Well, besides the fact that he was an escaped slave who'd spent the last year wandering through the Sinai Desert seeing incredible miracles such as the strongest army in the world drowned by a miraculous path through the Red Sea that caved in when an old man waved a staff. Also, the fact that he'd just been selected as a spy. Well, more of a scout, actually. His job was to march into enemy territory and see exactly how hard it would be to conquer. Now, this really seems like a pointless task, because God had already said that they would win the battle and take control of the Promised Land. And while the Bible states that God told Moses to send the spies, I feel like God did the whole spy sending for the people's sake. He obviously would have known that the Hebrews could have taken the land, but I'm sure the Hebrews may have looked at just rushing into the land as the unprincipled thing to do. But more of that later. We'll find out just how much use the spies were in a little bit. But hint, it wasn't a considerable amount. So the people went ahead and, per God's instructions, did the obligatory select one man from each tribe sort of thing. These men proceeded into the land, took 40 days scouting out everything, and brought a cluster of grapes so massive it had to be carried by two men. They also brought figs and pomegranates, so really grade A food for Bible times. Contrasted with the desert, this place was a paradise. Unfortunately for the people, ten of the spies were also self-proclaimed realists and started going on about the people who lived in the land, many of them giants, and their military strength, which was apparently quite good. Despite the fact that they'd seen ten unexplainable natural disasters devastate the most powerful country in the world, march through a large body of water on dry land, had mysterious food fall from the sky for the past year, and seen the actual presence of God— the Hebrews decided that some giants in a decently strong military would be too much for them. And they were terrified. Caleb and his co-spy Joshua got up to speak and basically said as much. They had literally been surrounded by supernatural occurrences for the past year or two. There was a supernatural cloud hanging above them right as they spoke that the religious leaders claimed was the presence of God himself. And all evidence pointed to the fact that it was. 
God literally spoke to their leaders audibly and told them what to do. Defeating the very strong militaries would not be particularly difficult with God on their side. The first ten spies were triggered. They changed their story from, This land is pretty great, but it would just be hard to conquer, to, It's an awful land that eats up its inhabitants. Don't look at the biggest bunch of grapes you've ever seen that we brought back from there. It's a horrible place. Oh, also, it's full of advanced civilizations and giants, and really only things that could be supported by a super fertile land. But no, it's a terrible doomscape. Oh, yes, the first ten spies reminded the people, and there were giants there, too. We looked like grasshoppers next to them. These weren't high fantasy giants, but taller than average ordinary people giants, so the grasshopper's comment sounded especially ridiculous. A note. Speaking of high fantasy type giants, sometime soon I might cover the book of Enoch, where demons have sex with humans and produce mile tall giants, which is apparently just a totally normal story that takes itself super seriously. However, besides the ridiculousness, there doesn't seem to be too much of a compelling story there, just a list of ridiculous facts, so I might hold off on that one. Anyway, back to the ten spies changing their opinion in ridiculous ways to advance their preferred narrative. Let's go. Apparently, the people completely bought what the ten spies were saying and did not listen to the logical, well-reasoned opinion of the two, even a little bit. They sat around, weeping and wailing and talking about the places where they should have died. Egypt, the wilderness, pretty much anywhere. They would be better off dead than trying to make a way for themselves. They then suggested getting a leader together and going back to slavery rather than taking the very good chances that an army of millions of Hebrews, plus God himself, would completely demolish their enemies. It was around this point that Moses and Aaron fell on their faces and started praying to God because this was not how they expected the night to go. Meanwhile, Caleb and Joshua got up and started speaking again, giving the same arguments as before besides reminding the people that God himself was on their side and that the giants and powerful armies wouldn't really do that great fighting against God. I'm pretty sure there was some sort of chant or mob rallying cry such as speech is violence or a frenzy where they tried to outdo each other in calling Caleb and Joshua the ancient world version of fascists. It definitely wasn't slave owners. The entire night was spent talking about how the Egyptian slave owners who beat them and drowned their children were quite nice compared to God, who killed those people, and Moses, who helped God kill those people. Regardless of how the rallying cry started, it ended with people throwing rocks at Caleb and Joshua, hoping to kill them, because it's a classic that whenever someone disagrees with you and doesn't have the capacity to argue against you, they punch you or beat you or kick you or try to kill you to shut you up. Turns out, God isn't a big fan of this, especially if you're trying to kill his servants because they were loyal to him. So around this point in the uprising, God shows up and the people know that they're in some major trouble. And we'll find out what God does right after this. There was a blinding light and everyone stopped dead. God went straight to the point. His first suggestion was to kill all the idiots and make Moses' descendants into a great nation. Wait, what? Moses was taken aback. Exactly what I said, God reasserted. Listen, they're trying to kill Caleb and Joshua. They wanted to kill you in the past, and that's definitely not the last time they're going to want to kill you. They're complete maniacs. I'm fed up. Moses held up his hand. Even if these people are complete maniacs, and I'm not disputing that right now, wouldn't that be shameful for you? God shook his head. He didn't understand. Could Moses explain further? Yeah, you did huge miracles to get these people out of Egypt. Literally everyone is watching you to see how good you are at this kind of thing. Imagine if you just kill them out here in the middle of the desert. Everyone will look and laugh and think that you just didn't have enough power to beat these dumb giants. Moses went straight to his point. God's main thing was how forgiving he was. He literally said this all the time. It was supposed to be a huge sell point. So how forgiving would he look if he just killed a bunch of people for insulting him? How powerful would he look if he killed a bunch of people in the middle of the desert instead of bringing them into the land that he'd promised? This was not cool. Moses really loved these people. He'd already begged for God to kill him as punishment for the sins of the Hebrews, but to spare them. 
So God stepped back. He would forgive these people. Okay, so God sounds like an absolute tyrant in this scene. But this is a recurring pattern throughout the Bible. God often puts the burden on his followers to advocate for others. God's followers are supposed to espouse incredible tolerance, long-suffering, and love. God never meant to kill the Hebrews, even though they were threatening to slaughter his servants in cold blood. Instead, he always gives people a chance to change their hearts. There are countless times when Moses, when Abraham, when Jeremiah, when Daniel, when other Bible heroes prayed for the lives of people that God was planning to punish for their evil ways. When they were forced to choose between their own self-interest and the interest of others, every time God's people chose others, others who hated them and wanted them dead, these were the people who had the character of God. We'll discuss the character of God in more depth with the story of Job coming up. Until then, there's one brief side note I want to make in this extremely deep rabbit hole. The Bible says, end quote, Noah was a righteous man in his generation. There's been a lot of debate as to what this means. Does this mean that Noah was objectively a very good person, and the fact that the people in his generation were so bad shows that he was all the better for it? Or does that mean that Noah was an all right person, but he was just very good compared to the rest of the people in his generation because the people in his generation were so bad? I'm not sure, but in light of what we've been discussing, it seems reasonable that he could be the second one. Countless Bible heroes prayed to God to spare the lives of people that were destined for punishment. And while I believe the flood was bound to happen no matter what, we have no record of Noah praying to God for his mercy on the world, but building an ark for the safety of his family first and foremost. Now, he did invite others to board the ark and join him, and those warnings did fall on deaf ears, but Noah never prayed to spare the world from the flood. There's a lot of debate that could be done on this subject, but it isn't as simple as God getting offended and deciding to wipe out the entire Hebrew population. Instead, it is God giving his servants a chance to show their selflessness and grace and to show the people the seriousness of their crimes. And their crimes were serious. They formed a mob and tried to kill people who were advocating on behalf of God just because they didn't like what they had to say. And so God gave them a very fair punishment. They didn't want to go into the promised land so badly that they tried killing the people who said it was a good idea. Fine. They would not be going into the promised land. Those 20 and above who had been part of the mob and fully aware of what they were doing would die in the wilderness. Only Caleb and Joshua of the older generation would be spared for standing up on behalf of God. To show that God was serious, the 10 spies who had led the mob against Caleb and Joshua died of the plague. The other Hebrews knew that God had been right and they had been wrong. They, too, were doomed. And so naturally, this was the best time to do what they had been completely opposed to the previous night. After trying to kill them, they now decide that Caleb and Joshua, who had said they could defeat the giants and take control of the promised land, were obviously right. It was a great idea to go and fight, despite the fact that God had just told them not to go and do it. Like, God literally went out of his way to go and warn them. He sent Moses out to tell them that his word was final. He was now punishing them for rebelling against him and trying to kill the people who said that they should go into the promised land. If they had decided to go into the promised land when Caleb and Joshua had advocated for it, then he would have supported them. But now, they weren't allowed to go. Did they think God would be with them when they did what he said only when they thought it was convenient? God was warning them. Moses was warning them. This was not a good idea. They were not going to win. And a few hours later, the ragtag remnants of the battle group came trudging back, wounded, bleeding, and sullen. They had tried their best, but from the beginning the battle had gone horribly. Not one of them had crossed the border into the promised land like Moses had warned. They were cursed. That night, Moses and Aaron pondered over God's words. He had said only those under 20 and Caleb and Joshua would ever see the promised land during their lives. Had he forgotten their names? Or did he know something they didn't? What would happen to them? Did those who had led the Hebrews to freedom have to be purged before they saw the full fruits of their labor? The same night, three men named Korah, Dathan, and Abiram sat around their campfire and smiled at each other. For a long time, they had been seeking more power. 
Each of them had a birthright claim to some power, but those two old men, Moses and Aaron, had been hoarding all the power in the camp for themselves. But with the camp in such disarray, did they seriously expect to hold on to power much longer? Very soon now, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram would make their move. The plans were almost complete. Very soon now, they would be the lords of the Hebrew people. Well, next time we'll obviously be finishing the story of Korah, and it will be a pretty crazy ride. I have three new episodes written, but not recorded yet, so hopefully I'll be releasing them a little bit faster than I have been. I'm hoping to release weekly for the next couple weeks, but we'll see how that goes. Credits to myself, Caleb Howard, for script writing and theme music. Special thanks to Anchor Podcasts for transition music, and to all my amazing supporters for listening to this podcast. Please subscribe, leave a review, and most of all, share it with your friends. All of you wonderful listeners is why I continue to produce new content. I appreciate all of you so much. That's all, and I'll see you soon.